Good evening, everyone. Make sure my sound's good. How's everybody doing? So um, I always have to humor myself before I get up here. I had this thing propped up a little higher, but the reflection really just had me seeing my double chin. <laughs> like, I don't want to look at that all night, so I'm propping it up on my Bible. <laughs> but um, So Terry has basically put me on schedule two times a year, so this is one of those days. Um, over the past five weeks, we've learned a lot about the different ways of God, and we could probably spend the rest of our lifetime having something about the ways of God um, up here on this stage. But um, we've looked at how God's ways are not our ways, and that's something we need to say to ourselves daily. Uh, we've learned about how fiery trials take us to glorious joy um, and how we can just see it as an opportunity for God to develop our faith whenever we come across hard things or hard things are in our lives. It's not because God's mad at you or he's trying to punish you, but he wants to take you from one degree of glory to the next, and it's a beautiful thing. And we've learned that what is written trumps what is right. Uh, that's just one of the mottos we like to live by, what is written. And one of my favorites and not so favorites, but how grudges have to be released God's way. Um, I remember on a Tuesday, I was asking Terry, so what are you teaching about tomorrow? And she's like, I'm going to teach about grudges. And I was like, I mean, I already started to feel convicted. Um, and so God was through that message, uh, showed me about a grudge I was holding against somebody really close to me. And of course, last week we learned that the way to life is death, and Terry spoke about surrender. So this time of year, usually like January through March, is just always a special time to me because about six years ago in 2017, um, I was at the end of myself. Uh, I was running my marriage into the ground, and I had nowhere else to turn. And so I was like, God, I've tried everything else. Um, I'm about to wreck my family. I didn't even know what surrender was. Uh, and, uh, you know, she said, I've been coming to church here for a long time, so you can be coming to church and not really walking with the Lord, not really surrendered. I was basically hiding out in kids' ministry, um, and I was here in my mind for the sake of my husband and my kids because I was too far from being redeemed. But I knew that, I knew God was God. At least I had that much faith, and I started to just, chase after him in late 2016, and I wanted to find out what God had to say and his word had to say about being a woman and being a wife, because I was terrible at both of those things. And so that led, and I didn't come to women's. Um, Terry was here not that long at that time, but in my opinion, like women were catty and gossipy, so <laughs> I didn't want anything to do with the women's ministry. And my son was really young at the time, so I always used that as my justification not to ever come to women's ministry. Um, but I knew in some of the studying I started to do in my, what I call now my surrender journey, um, some of the things that I would read, especially for those that might have troubles in their marriage, is that you need the accountability of fellow Christian women, not men. Don't go talking um, about your marriage problems to another man. Talk to other women and talk to God. And so by learning that, I knew that I needed to, I needed to start coming to women's and Someone had shared on Facebook, uh, Terry's starting a new teaching in January about how to be a woman. I was like, oh, well, look at that. That's what I'm studying. <laughs> and uh, I remember, because I had this book, and it was like, where to find it in your Bible? And I was highlighting every verse that it said about woman and wife. And one of the passages was in Titus. And I remember highlighting it, and I thought to myself, I said, I've never even heard of Titus. Who is Titus? I've never heard this book of the Bible. And so I went to women's, and Terry opens up, and she said, oh, we're going to be talking about being a woman. I'm going to be teaching out of the book of Titus. <laughs> and uh, I, I was like, ooh, Holy Spirit, I think that's what that is. Um, and so just through that teaching, through your faithfulness, uh, God absolutely wrecked my world. And you were teaching about surrender. And that's where it all began for me. And six years later, I'm only six years old in the Lord. <laughs> so a lot of grace um, I've had to give myself over the past couple years as I've learned to grow and walk with him. But it's just been an amazing journey um, to just fully put it all in into God's word. And he's opened up the opportunity for me to come on staff here. And it's just for me to be in front of you beautiful ladies and just to share, you know, what I've learned by walking with God. I'm not some professional speaker or anything like that, but I love God and I love his word. 
And if there's anything that I want, is for you guys to feel the same way. So um, let me pray real quick, and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, God, just thank you so much for this night. Thank you for every soul in this room. I thank you for the word that you've given me for each and every woman here in this place, Father God. I pray that it would just go forth and pierce hearts tonight, Father God. Let nothing be held back from your word, from your purpose, from your truth, from your love, Father God. You love each woman in this room, and you desire for them to come closer to you, to draw closer to you, and to surrender their all to you, Father God. I pray that you would just equip me and flow through me like only you can. I love you, Lord, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've spent a long time, well, five weeks. That's a pretty long series for Terry, but I'm sure she could talk about the Lord forever. It's one of my favorite things to do with her here on staff. We don't get many opportunities to do that, but talking about Scripture always just brings us a lot of joy. And we've talked about the ways of God, and they're beyond our, com- our comprehension Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. The ways of God are genuinely otherworldly. They are beyond anything that we can comprehend, and I'm completely okay with that. There's freedom in allowing God to be God in our lives. When you get to know his heart and his character and his sovereignty, which we will spend our entire lives getting to know if we choose so, it's genuinely freeing. And I knew Terry talked about surrender last week, and I was kind of thinking I sort of wanted to talk about that too, but when I heard like she was talking about it, I'm like, well, maybe that's not what God wants me to talk about, I don't know. But I always pray over what God wants me to uh, share with you ladies, and then I know that uh, surrender is super near to my heart, and it's not a one-time thing. Uh, Just because I surrendered my life six years ago doesn't mean it's been easy street. It's actually been really hard, Um, but it's a daily decision to die to yourself. And then this morning, in my utmost for his highest, the title was The Surrendered Life. And uh, this is what he says. He says, "To to become one with Jesus Christ, a person must be willing not to only give up sin, but also to surrender his whole way of looking at things. Being born again by the Spirit of God means that we must first be willing to let go before we can grasp something else. The first thing we must surrender is all of our pretense or deceit. What our Lord wants us to present to him is not our goodness, because we have none, our honesty, we're a bunch of liars, and, or our efforts to do better. Um, That is just going to exhaust you and trying to do good works to earn God's favor. He calls them filthy rags, which is translated as menstrual pads in the Old Testament. That's how disgusted he is with us trying to earn favor through our works. I I lost my place. So he doesn't want us to present any of those things, but our real solid sin. Actually, that is all he can take from us. And what he gives us in exchange for our sin is real solid righteousness but we must surrender all pretense, which is all assumption or natural inclination, just the way we would think about things. So we need to surrender all of our assumptions, our natural inclinations, that we are, um, that we are anything, and give up all claims of even being worthy of God's consideration. Once we have done that, the Spirit of God will show us what we need to surrender next. Along each step of this process, We will have to give up our claims to our rights to ourselves. Are we willing to surrender our grasp on all that we possess, our desires, and everything else in our lives? Are we ready to be identified with the death of Jesus Christ? We will suffer a sharp, painful disillusionment before we fully surrender. When people really see themselves as the Lord sees them, it's not the terribly offensive sins of the flesh that shook them, but the awful nature of pride in their own hearts opposing Jesus Christ. When they see themselves in the light of the Lord, the shame, horror, and desperate conviction hit home for them. If you are faced with the question on whether or not to surrender, make a determination to go on through the crisis, surrendering all that you have and all that you are to him, and God will then equip you to do all that he requires of you. So I want to teach all of you beautiful ladies about surrender too. Um, And instead of really focusing on the dying to self, which is definitely important, you can't have life in Christ without death to yourself. 
Um, I want to teach on the way of humility, the way we just humble ourselves before God, and it's a daily thing um, in living a surrendered life. And it's going to be a bit of a compare and contrast lesson, kind of like we did in school. If you're learning about something and you want to learn what humility is, so you have to kind of learn about something that maybe is not humility. Um, so in order for, for us to know and understand humility and what that looks like in our own lives, we also must know and understand pride. Um, Proverbs 3.34 says, He, God, mocks the mockers, but gives grace to the humble. Some translations say that he scorns the scorners. So a scorner is a person who treats someone or something with contempt or mockery, a scoffer. A mocker is defined as someone who attacks or treats with ridicule, contempt, which is the feeling of which a person regards anything um, considered mean, vile, or worthless disdain or scorn. And James and Peter both reference this proverb. Um, James 4 through 6, or 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. This is why it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Then in Peter, 1 Peter 5, 5, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So opposing this context in the Greek means to set oneself against, to be opposed in principle and practice, to resist or reject the entire makeup of something. So proud, it means arrogant, trying to overshine, trying to be more than God directs, uh, showing oneself above others with an overestimate of one's means or merits, um, despising others or even treating them with contempt or haughty. God is against the proud. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to be against me. I can be in Christ, a beloved daughter of God, yet God can still oppose me and my ways if I'm walking in pride. In our pride, our ways, we set ourselves against God, and our natural mind uh, is hostile towards God. It's the human condition. It's the sinful condition. Romans 8, 7 says, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not, it does not submit to God's law, nor can, it do, nor can it do so. So let me say this. We all, 100% of us in this room, struggle with pride. So I want everyone to repeat after me, I struggle with pride. pride. All right, good job. If you had a hard time even saying that, then you definitely struggle with pride. (laughs) But there's hope for us all. So uh, when I first surrendered to God, he filled me with his spirit, and I I had such a ferocious hunger for his word. Um, I couldn't get enough of it, and the knowledge that I gained from Scripture and the revelations that I got from him, they were just, they were like drugs. Like, I just couldn't get enough from him. But as I grew in knowledge, I also grew a little confident in myself. I thought it was such a gift to the kingdom of God. (laughs) And I gladly judged those struggling and could oh so easily see their pride in issues that kept them from God, and I would gladly let them know Of course, like a coward through an email or a passive aggressive comment, all of this was great and all until God showed me my own pride. So one Saturday morning, I was having my quiet time and then I was reading through an article on pride. Of course, as I was reading it, I had someone else in mind that this article was all about. (laughs) About halfway through the article, God opened my heart and cut me deep. He said, Irene, this article isn't about her, it's about you. It was such a dagger that, I mean, I literally could not finish reading. I had to go to my bedroom and just weep before God because it absolutely crushed me. Um, And that kind of revelation of your own pride can only come from God. You can try to show somebody how prideful they are, but it's not usually that effective. And I'll talk about a story later where we can trust God even with someone walking in pride. But it was God's kindness that he revealed me to myself My pride was not in agreement with God, and I could not go on walking with him if I was going in the wrong direction. So Amos 3.3 says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? So in my pride and my arrogance, I had set myself against God, and if I was going to go with him, I had to change my ways. So if I'm walking in pride, I'm not in agreement with him, and I'm not walking with him. So if you tend to err on the side of, I'm not really a prideful person, Um, you might have something in your mind that you think pride is or looks like, and that's not really you, but you got to remember that the ways of a man are right in his own eyes. 
Um, that scripture is enough to scare me to always humble myself before the Lord because we can all be blind to our own faults and pride, thinking that we're right when we aren't. So I wanted to share a little bit about this article um, that I read that humbled me. That humbled me. Um, it was from DesiringGod.com, and it was called The Seven Subtle Symptoms of Pride, and it was actually adapted from an essay by um, Jonathan Edwards, who was a famous preacher um, from the 1700s. So it says, pride will kill you forever. Pride is the sin most likely to keep you from crying out for a savior. Those who think they are well will not look for a doctor. As seriously dangerous as pride is, it's equally hard to spot. When it comes to diagnosing our hearts, those of us who have had the disease of pride have a challenging time identifying our sickness. Pride infects our eyesight, causing to view ourselves through a lens that colors and distorts reality. Pride will even paint our ugliness and sin as beautiful and commendable. So here are some of the subtle signs of pride. One of those is fault finding. And while pride causes us to filter out the evil we see in ourselves, it also causes us to filter out God's goodness in others. We sift them, letting only their faults fall into our perception of them. Edwards writes, The spiritually proud person shows it in his finding fault with other saints. The eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own that he is not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. Another sign of pride is a harsh spirit. Again, Edwards writes, Christians who are but fellow worms ought to at least treat one another with as much humility and gentleness as Christ treats them. And uh, this was something that was true of me. I said, like, my marriage is what drove me to God. And I remember one day grumbling before the Lord about all the issues I felt my husband had. And God just gently revealed to me, because I've got a son, he's my baby, my only boy, and I adore him. And God was like, how would you feel if you were Maddox's wife? I said, well, I won't shut my mouth then. <laughs> um, but and he does that to show us, like, you just need to calm down. Uh, you are just as, you know, much of a sinner and struggle with things as your husband does, and give him some grace. Uh, and I definitely would not, at the time, and I'm still working on it, would not have wanted someone like me married to my son. Um, another sign of pride is superficiality. So when pride lives in our hearts, we're far more concerned about others' perceptions of us than the reality of our hearts. Another sign is defensiveness. True humility is knocked off balance and thrown into a defensive posture by a challenge or a rebuke. But instead, it continues in doing good and trusting the soul to our faithful creator. Edward says, for the humble Christian, the more the world is against him, the more silent and still he will be, unless it is in his prayer closet, and there he will not be still. And I don't know about you, but if somebody says something that goes against my opinion of myself or whatever, my instinct is to get defensive and want to defend myself. But that's where we've got to, whenever those feelings rise up, you submit them to God, just like you submit to God, and they have to submit to him as well. And Because it's not true. Like, usually your first instinct, especially if it's harsh or critical, that's not from the Spirit. You have to submit it and allow God to just teach you through that. Um, and I've learned I don't have to defend myself. God can do that. And another symptom of pride is presumption before God. Yes, we can boldly come before God, not because of anything we have done, but because of the finished work of Christ. And we must always remember that God is God Almighty and to cultivate a healthy reverence for him. We can't let our pride fool us into being overly confident and arrogant before a holy God. And then also on the flip side, we have others that other, others of us that feel no confidence before God, which sounds like humility, but in reality, it's another symptom of pride. In those moments, we're testifying that we believe our sins are greater than his grace, which is not true. We doubt the power of Christ's blood, and we're stuck staring at ourselves instead of Christ. Another sign is that we're desperate for attention. Glory hog, anyone? <laughs> Pride is hungry for attention, respect, and worship in all of its forms. Maybe it sounds like shameless boasting about ourselves. Maybe it's being unable to say no to anyone because we need to be needed. Maybe it looks like obsessively thirsting for marriage or fantasizing about a better marriage because you're hungry to be adored. 
Maybe it looks like being haunted by your desire for the right car, the right house, or the right title at work, all because you seek the glory that comes from men and not from God. Everything that we want is met in the presence of God. There is nothing that he can't fulfill in you that we try to get filled anywhere else. And we, well, we have to learn that. And uh, the last symptom of pride, which there's many more, this is just from the article, is neglecting others. Pride prefers some people over others. It honors those who the world deems worthy of honor, giving more weight to their words, their wants, and their needs. And I don't know about you, but I've pretty much dealt with every single one of those symptoms. If not currently, I've had, a <clears throat> I've had at some time. So what do we do? Um, it can be a little frightening listening to all of these symptoms of pride and thinking we've really just screwed this thing up and wondering if there's even any hope for us. Why do we even try? But because of Jesus, there is always hope. We're all works in progress. No one is too far gone from the grace of God, which we also desperately need. Remember, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And a humble person is simply this, someone who depends on the Lord rather than themselves. It means being God-reliant rather than self-reliant. While that may sound simple, in our culture, it's not easy to live out. The culture of this world implores us to exalt ourselves, to put ourselves first, to be fearless, brave, independent women. It appeals to the very downfall of our nature, yet it seems and feels so right and good, and it's difficult to withstand because it taunts our very flesh. And there's so much out there now within like the self-help realm and stuff that seems so scripturally based, and it seems so like glorious, but it's just deception, and it's leading you down a road to just exalt yourself. And it's hard because our flesh wants that stuff. It wants to be gratified. But Jesus said himself in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and this is just what blew my mind today. I looked up that word for weak, um, and it means without strength or vigor, living in a state of weakness or depletion. It refers to a lack of necessary resource, resources. Basically, we're insufficient. Um, we're feeble and we're sick. The flesh is sick. We are diseased. Jesus came for the sick. He said, it isn't the well who need a doctor, but the sick, and that is every single one of us. As believers, we want to learn to live and fully rely on God. However, our pride, this flesh, our sinful nature will work against that desire. You know, when you talk about surrender, if you just look at the Russia and Ukraine, you know, Russia didn't just go in and Ukraine was like, all right, you can have it. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's trying to move in through your flesh and your body and wants dominion, but you have to willingly surrender and submit. It's not going to come at a fight like we have in scripture, different references to our body says that we have members and stuff and some parts of our thought patterns, the way we grew up and stuff like that, they don't always submit willingly to, the, to what God's word says. So there's a fight sometimes that has to take place. So just be patient with yourself. Know that as you're continuing to seek after God, you will experience some resistance from yourself. It's not always the enemy attacking you. It's just your flesh being your flesh. But uh, we need to learn... You know, we want to, as believers, to learn to rely on God. But again, our flesh will want to combat that desire. And we don't have it within ourselves, just like it was saying, flesh is insufficient. We don't have it within ourselves without God to overcome the flesh. It'll just leave us frustrated. This is why God's word calls us to humble ourselves. And this is part of surrendering. Um, it's a daily admission of one's position before God, of our need for God, and of our inability to live a godly life without him. It's a daily clothing of ourselves in humility. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, um, this is a verse, and it's Peter's basically telling the believers. First, he addresses the elders and the young man, but then he says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility um, toward one another. Just like we get dressed before we go to work, you know, for our days, we also need to get dressed spiritually. You're not going to go out of the house without your clothes on or your pajamas on unless maybe you're running to Dollar General, and that's okay. <laughs> I like that Dollar General crowd. I can wear whatever I want to just about. You don't even need teeth. 
<laughs> Especially at the one by my house. It's pretty ragged. But we typically, you would need to get ready. You need to get dressed. It's the same thing spiritual, spiritually. We have to prepare our minds for the day ahead. You have to clothe yourself in humility because if you just go out the gate, I mean, I'm not saying you have to have a morning quiet time. I don't want anyone to get like hung up on that. That's when I usually have my quiet time. But if you're the structure of your day, you got little kids, it's better for you to do it at night. But it don't take no time to be like, God, you're God. I'm not God. I submit this day to you. Be with me in Jesus' name, amen. And just have that daily like submission to God and just clothe yourself in humility. Just be like, God, you know what's going on today and I have no idea. So whatever comes my way, it's passed through your hands and so let's do this thing. And uh, that's just, just a habit that's good to get into because we do not know everything that's going on. Um, we need to clothe ourselves in humility and so to have humility is to have a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's depravity. We are very depraved apart from God. Humility is the inside-out virtue produced by comparing ourselves to the Lord rather than to others. And it's very humbling to pr compare yourself to the Lord because he's Lord Almighty, God, you know, in the flesh, Jesus came and lived a perfect life. We are far from that. So that's a way of just kind of humbling yourself before him. And don't compare yourself to others because that's foolish and prideful to do that. And it says so in 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Um, and it'll just lead you down a road of discontentment and stuff when you start to do that. Most of the time when you're scrolling social media and you're looking at somebody's nice house or nice abs, it doesn't leave you in a happy place. <laughs> Um, so don't, don't come, and even when it comes to your walk with Christ, I remember early on seeing maybe even someone like Terry or someone, you know, we're all seeing everyone's outside facade. You have no idea what's going on in someone's heart, but it's so easy to be like, oh, but you know, you have it easy. You get to come up here and teach all these women. That's not always easy, but you know, it's just, we compare ourselves and want to dismiss like where we are in our walk with God. And that's just foolish. So, but we are to compare ourselves with the Lord Christ. It, this will bring our behavior into alignment with this inner revelation to keep one from being self-exalting, self-determining, and self-inflated. Humil humility means living in complete dependence on the Lord with no reliance on the self or the flesh. So deliberate surrender should be our daily practice. Knowing God loves us and is in control, we can fully submit ourselves to him whatever that looks like and whatever it may bring. Humbling ourselves can be scary to fully give up control because we're some control freaks and place ourselves in the hands of God in all things, surrendering your marriage, surrendering your kids, your future um, to a God that you can't see. That's going to give you a little bit of anxiousness. It might make you nervous, but that's why Peter says, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God Almighty, the creator of the universe, cares for you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. I mean, when you look at the vastness of space and just how finite we are in the grand scheme of things, it's just, it's, you can't even imagine it, but God cares about you. Don't let anyone else or yourself tell you otherwise. Fight to believe that truth. And he's not mad at you because surrendering and humbling yourself makes you anxious. He wants you to give him, his, give him your anxieties. He knows you're going to experience that. It doesn't mean something's wrong with you. We are human. We're flesh. Our flesh is jacked up. So if you're scared, it's okay. God says, trust me, and you can do it scared. Don't wait for that moment when you don't feel afraid. Just submit your fear to God. And then Paul wrote to the believers in Philippi, encouraged them to imitate the humility of Christ, who is our ultimate example of humility. This is uh, from Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, 
Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So think about it. Jesus, part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he became a human being. That's why it calls, they call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus, God in flesh, he walked this earth. He breathed the same air as us. He was tempted in every way that we are, and he was Jesus. He was with God in the beginning, and as Scripture says, in the very nature of God, yet he did not consider his position, his equality with God, as something to be used for his own advantage. He did not exploit his equality with God for selfish ends. He very easily could have, but he didn't exercise his positional authority. You know, Emily was saying, I've been in the military for 19 years, and it's fine. You know, like, I don't like to make big to-do about it. Um, I don't even want to tell you guys what rank I am, but so I'm a senior master sergeant, which is like the next to the last rank on the enlisted side. So I've made it pretty high up considering it's just the grace of God. I don't know why they put me in this position. I'm like, are you guys sure? Um, Sometimes they're like, you just hang around long enough, you'll make chief. I was like, all right, thanks. (laughs) But, um, But, you know, and a lot of A lot of times, like, they have this little book that explains all the things you're entitled to at your rank, and uh, there's this saying we say a lot that says rank has its privileges, so I'm going to be like, hey, airmen, go take out the trash, but I don't like doing that. I'm usually taking out the trash, but um, not to say I'm so humble and all. Uh, (laughs) But Jesus, who in the very nature was God, did not use that to his advantage. I'm telling you, even when I came on staff here, and I've got drill once a month, and Sunday's my biggest work day of the week, and I was feeling some type of way about drill. I was pissed. (laughs) And I was like, surely I can use all this time that I've been in to finagle some kind of deal and maybe talk to my commander. Can you just let me come in late on Sundays? I was trying to use it to my advantage. But thankfully, I have a commander that was like, you signed an oath, you raised your right hand, I need you here. And sometimes I'm like, we don't even do anything on Sunday morning. But I have to submit to the authority, so I will. Um, And God's just kind of spanked my way through that. Um, But, I mean, it's so easy for us to want to do, even like as wise, we feel like we're entitled for our husbands to treat us the way God calls them to in the Bible. And how many of them actually do that? (laughs) But it's like, then we get mad. We want to get mad because you're not treating me the way the Bible says. And I'm like, that's not how it works. You know, the Bible says, without our words. Um, so it's so easy for us to want to, like, use our position or what we think we're entitled to to our advantage, and Jesus himself did not do that. When it says in Philippians 2, 7 that he made himself nothing, um, in the original language and other translations, it says that he emptied himself. And that word for emptying himself means to empty out, to render void, to be emptied without recognition, to be perceived as valueless. Jesus said, I'm of no value. I will empty myself out to save humanity. What on earth? That just blows my mind. Um, Jesus made himself nothing. He did this by taking on the form or nature of a servant. He emptied himself out to be perceived as valueless by becoming a service, the lowest of positions on earth. We get mad, you know, if someone cuts us, fall, cuts us off in traffic and Jesus took on the form of a servant, like, who are we? Um, surrendering, humbling ourselves is saying, God, I give up rights to myself. I give up what I think I deserve. I just want to fully live for you. If Jesus emptied himself, becoming a servant, and we're to imitate the humility of Christ, therefore, we also are to empty ourselves and to look out for others. This is what humbling ourselves is. And so the world will tell you things like you can't pour from an empty cup to fill yourself first. Take care of yourself. God says, empty yourself. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Consider others better than yourselves. This is another way of God that is beyond our way of reasoning. Empty yourself and let God 
feel you. It doesn't make any sense, but it's the truth. It is so countercultural, but it's a truly fulfilling life. Nothing on this earth can feel you like God can, and this is how he does it. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. He was humiliated. He was mocked, taunted, rejected, beaten, ultimately emptied. This was the ultimate form of humility, the ultimate form of service. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And because of this, Philippians 2, 9 through 11 goes on to say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself and God exalted him to the highest place. God exalts those who humble themselves. 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. I believe God's word calls us to humble humble ourselves because choosing the way of humility and fully relying on God is better than being humbled, but sometimes God uses both, and perhaps it's some encouragement if you're like me um, and you're afraid sometimes of your pride. Like, there's been times where I've been fearful to either put a message out on Facebook or something like that because I feel like I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, it's, and it's almost like paralyzing sometimes, and I don't, I don't make any progress because I'm so afraid of my pride getting in, on, getting in the way. But fortunately for us, God can also humble us, so we don't need to be stuck in a place of fear because we're so afraid of, oh, am I doing it for the wrong reasons? You just go forward and trust that God is good, He is for you, and He will refine your motives if He needs to. Um, And there are so many examples of pride and God humbling people all throughout Scripture. Um, But this one, I've just recently been in the book of Daniel, comes to mind. And then I'll close after this. So King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, if you don't know the story, uh, I just encourage you to go in and read Daniel. Um, This is from Daniel chapter 4, which takes place after the fiery furnace. A lot of us might remember that if you grew up in church, Sunday school story. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown into the fiery furnace. And that's a whole other story for another day, but it's super, super, super cool. Like, there's little details they don't tell you in Bible school. But after, you know, they got thrown into the fiery furnace, they didn't get burned up, they didn't even smell like smoke, they come out, and, you know, there was another dude in there that wasn't in there. It was probably like an angel. Some people said it was Jesus, but... You know, God basically saved them from being burned up because they wouldn't submit and bow down to this statue. And so after they came out, King Nebuchadnezzar was like, praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble So no, for no other god can save in this way. So he said all of this in chapter 4. And then we get to chapter 5, uh, which is said to be sometime after the fiery furnace, Um, And just to kind of sum it up, the king had this really crazy dream where there was this huge tree and like it was beautiful. It had all this pretty foliage, all this fruit, and it extended to the ends of the earth. But then it was, there was like an angel of the Lord that said, destroy it. And it got cut down to the stump. All the leaves got stripped away and the king would be driven away to live with wild donkeys and basically go insane, grow claws and feathers like an eagle and eat grass. The Bible is crazy, especially the Old Testament. You guys should read it. But uh, it said God that would restore his kingdom as soon as he acknowledged that the most high is ruler over human king. And this is still like the dream and its interpretation. So um, God would restore his kingdom as soon as he acknowledged that the most high is the ruler over the human kingdoms and that God will give them to anyone he wants and that heaven rules. So about 12 months after he had this dream and Daniel gave him the interpretation, the king's out on the roof of his palace. He's overlooking the beauty of Babylon. And the king, the king explain, exclaims, he said, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? And while the words were still in his mouth, a voice came from heaven and said, To you, it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. And all that was said in the dream and interpretation came to pass. And so while he was out, 
with feathers and claws eating grass, he finally looked up, which is acknowledging his position before God, and his sanity was restored. And then he praised the Most High and honored and glorified him. And then this is the verse that ends the chapter. I just kind of paraphrased all of that. He says, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the King of heavens because all of his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. So God is able to humble those who walk in, walk in pride. Who's able to humble those who walk in pride? God is. Good job. And he's done that for me. Terry, I know he's done that for you. Carrie, I know he's also done that for you. Um, walking through being humbled and humbling ourselves isn't always going to be easy. Um, it can be outright humiliating, and I think that's why those have the same root word. But if you think about Jesus on the cross, he was naked. We clean it up. Like, he didn't have any clothes on. Like, you know, my kids are trying to walk in while I'm getting dressed or something. Like, oh, oh, trying to cover up. But, like, Jesus out on the cross no clothes on. He was absolutely humiliated, and that's not even touching the surface of the suffering that he went through. So it is, yes, it can be humiliating to humble yourselves. Um, that's why those words are similar in the way they sound, humiliating, humble yourself. But we have a Savior who loves us. He's walked in this flesh. He understands how weak we are, and he knows what it is to be human. Um, he humbled himself fully, and he's our example so I encourage everyone in here to pray often, if not daily, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We cannot detect our hidden pride. It is so deceitful, but God can and will if you let him. Um, I've prayed this prayer, and God has shown me some ugly things. I've had to go and apologize to friends, to my husband. It's humbling, but humility is the way we are to walk, and we don't do this alone. God will reveal those things to you and lead you in the way everlasting. We are to live our lives with an eternal perspective. You know, that little bit of embarrassment you have or that fear you have in going to tell, you know, your husband about things maybe you've done or to go apologize to a friend because you're too prideful. It's temporary. It's little things. In the grand scheme of things, I'm like, what does it matter in light of eternity? Jesus is the one who works in us and through us. As believers, it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And as Terry said last week, the way to life is through dying. And if we are in Christ, the work is finished. We just have to fight to believe it and continually surrender to him who is able, and he will complete the work that he started in each one of us. So let's empty ourselves, clothe ourselves with humility, and live the fulfilling lives that God has called each one of us to do.